All right, let's see if we're working. Thanks for coming to another live stream. I'm just gonna check this out and make sure that we're actually connected. Make sure my YouTubes are still working. Make sure my internet is actually working. There we go. Looks like we got like a 15 second delay, but that's okay. Let me close this. Hello there, and welcome to another live stream. This time we are just doing a, a general Q&A. So if you're here and you have questions, go ahead and type them in the chat and we will just answer some questions. Maybe first we can just go on a little bit of a rant because I'm a sad, lonely person who is very angry and shouty, and this is what I like to do, is I like to get angry and go on rants. So this isn't really a rant, but this is just something that uh, popped up on Facebook. When somebody, somebody asked a question in one of the acupuncture groups, what is acupuncture school like? Is it a lot of cramming and memorization, or do they find more enjoyable ways to teach the curriculum? And so this is a, a, on, a, on one of the Facebook groups, and presumably this is someone who is thinking about going into school and hasn't yet, and they're just wondering, what's it like? Is it a lot of cramming and memorization, or do we go a little bit deeper than that? And actually my response to this was yes it's a lot of cramming and memorization. And I think some people didn't like that, but I want to kind of defend that statement that, yes, it is a lot of cramming and memorization. And to some extent, you need to accept that, be aware of that. And especially when you're starting out, you need to very early on develop some good strategies of how do you memorize things? Do you like to use flashcards? Do you like to uh, write things out? Some people get a notebook and they just write things over and over. That was better for me, it was writing things out. I never really liked flashcards. Do you like tables? Do you record yourself and then listen to it later? Uh, you need some way to memorize things because it turns out learning Chinese medicine is a lot of memorization. And I think that's not a bad thing. I think a lot of people look down on that. And I know that I was one of those people when I first started out. I was like, memorization is the lowest form of learning. I have a background in mathematics, and I had this attitude of, if you understand the concept, you don't need to memorize. If you understand what it means for a secant line to be parallel to a tangent line, you don't need to memorize the second fundamental theorem of calculus. You, you just know what that means. So I was very resistant to that at first. And then I had experiences in the clinic where there were just things like, I didn't know the she-clef point on the spleen channel. I understood the concept of a she-clef point. I understood what was going on with the, with the chi at a she-clef point. I knew that she-clef points treat, treated acute conditions and pain and that they could do things with the blood on the yin channels. But when it came to what's the she-clef point channel or what's a she-clef point on the spleen channel, I just didn't know. And that was limiting my ability to do a treatment because I hadn't, didn't memorize that very basic information. So I would say, especially in the first year, that yes, it is a lot of memorization and cramming. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes I use this analogy of, say you're learning to play, the, play a musical instrument. I played the piano when I was young, and then I also played the saxophone. It turns out that a lot of people, when they, their goal of being able to play a musical instrument is they want to be expressive. They want to create beautiful music that sounds very lovely and very nice. It turns out when you're learning to play the saxophone, that's really not how it is in the beginning. When you learn to play an instrument in the beginning, it's really boring. It's like you're playing a bunch of scales. You're playing long tones to develop your tone in your embouchure. You're doing tonguing exercises. You're doing fingering exercises. And you're just playing scales and arpeggios. And it's really boring. And it's really easy to be like, oh, I hate this. I just wanted to make beautiful music. And I'm just playing all these boring scales. Well, it turns out you have to start that way in order to have a foundation. Um, you, you need those basic skills to have a foundation in order to then go on and create that beautiful music. And so there are a lot of people that they skip that first step and they try to move on to the other stuff and they find out later that they're kind of crappy at it, like they're really bad, that now they have to go back and relearn that stuff and it's really hard now because they've developed some bad habits or they just don't have the discipline to do it. 
Or another analogy would be like learning a martial art. Again, a lot of people get into martial arts because like, oh, I want to learn how to fight. I want to learn how to kick ass. I saw this cool thing on this video and I want to learn how to do that. It turns out when you start learning martial arts, it's really freaking boring. You usually spend like the first six months doing stances, doing stretches, just strengthening your legs so you can get into a good horse stance. I remember um, I took Bagua Zhang for a while and, and basically uh, eight trigram palm and basically we did palm strikes. And the guy was like, okay, the way you do this is you do a thousand of these every day. And if you do that every day for six months, then we'll teach you how to walk around in a circle. And so again, that can be really frustrating because it's just, you're just doing this boring, repetitive stuff, but you need that. You need to develop that foundation. Otherwise, when you get into the more advanced stuff and you're like, ooh, I want to fight, uh, the people who skip that step, step, turns out they're really crappy fighters. Uh, their punches have no power because they don't have a firm base. They didn't develop their legs in the horse stance or the various stances. Now their, their strikes don't have any power behind them, and it turns out they're just crappy fighters. And so they basically wasted their time, and now they have to go back. Well, it turns out studying Chinese medicine is the same thing. We have to develop a foundation. And it turns out what is the foundation? It's memorizing that boring crap, like the big picture, the point categories, the locations of the point, the functions of the point, the definitions of the 28 pulse images. It turns out you just have to memorize that stuff in order to establish a foundation. And then later we can go on into the more exciting stuff of how to actually heal people. And when you have that foundation, your treatments become more powerful because you can fall back on that rather than just being like, I'm going to use my intuition because I never actually bothered to learn the material that was in the textbooks. And that's just not a good way to heal your patients. So I think that is, yes, there is a lot of memorization and cramming. That primarily happens in your first year, so you need to accept that. You need to have a good strategy of how to do that. And then later, once you build that foundation, you'll be able to move on. And so I think that... Especially if you know the author Bob Flaws. Bob Flaws, he's, I think he usually publishes through Blue Poppy Press. He wrote a lot of stuff earlier, kind of in the 90s and early 2000s, so I'm not sure if people are as familiar with him, but he wrote a lot of our early books in Chinese medicine. And it turns out he was really big on memorizing things. If you look at his pulse diagnosis book, in the, in the introduction of that book, he talks about if you want to be good at pulse diagnosis, the first step is you need to memorize the word-for-word -word definition of each of the 28 pulse images. If you don't know the definition of a pulse image, there's no way you can diagnose that pulse. And so I think that it kind of makes sense when it's like, if you don't know the definition of a soggy pulse, how can you tell if the patient has a soggy pulse? And I've had this come up in clinic where, where people will be like, oh, to me, this, this pulse feels very soggy. I'm like, what is a soggy pulse? Describe to me in words what a soggy pulse is. And I'm like, I don't know. Well, it's, how do you know it's a soggy pulse? Or they'll be like, or I had some people students who were like, oh, I think the pulse is, it's, flow, it's deep and it's soggy. It's deep and soggy. I'm like, no, it's not. The definition of a soggy pulse is it's floating or superficial, it's thin or fine, and it's weak or forceless. So the, you can't say a pulse is deep and soggy. If the pulse is deep, it's by definition not soggy. And so you need to be able to accurately identify the pulse images if you're going to use them in your diagnosis. So he kind of... So Bob Flaws, at least, is really big on this memorization thing, and it turns out in one of his books, uh, Statements of Fact in Chinese Medicine, he explains on this more. So uh, I took a little photo of this. Um, maybe I should say, basically, Bob Flaws wrote this book called Statements of Fact in Chinese Medicine. He just took basic statements about um, yin and yang, the five organs, and on a lot of our fundamental stuff, and he just said these are basic statements. If you want to be good at Chinese medicine, you need to memorize these statements. And so a lot of people don't like that, so he gave some justification for it in his introduction. And he talks about when he's a Buddhist student, uh, he said there are th three steps to learning. First, one should learn the meaning and not just the words. Second, one should learn the words and not just the meaning. 
And third, one should learn the words in their proper order, since it's assumed there's logic to that order that's been honed by generations. So he's saying this is a three-step process. You need to learn the words, you need to memorize just rotely the word-for-word -word definition, then you need to understand the meaning, then you need to know kind of how they go together and what is implied by the proper order. Then he goes on to say, um, it is my experience that Asian students, kind of cuts off there, but he says that in his teaching experience, with Asian students, they are very good at memorizing the words, but not necessarily really great at understanding the meaning behind those words. Whereas as Western students, they were very good at trying to understand the meaning, but they were never very good at understanding the words, the actual words. And I've noticed this is true just from students that have commented on videos and students that have emailed me. Uh, they, they've also inadvertently made this observation where they say they have a lot of uh, Asian teachers that came from China, studying in China, were doctors in China. And so they're very knowledgeable, they're very good healers, but when it comes to teaching, they basically just throw out a bunch of information and expect you to memorize it and don't necessarily explain why it is the way it is. And I think that's why people, they would say, oh, that's why we like these videos, is because you actually make connections and explain the meaning behind some of these statements. But it's true that we, we need to know both. We need to memorize and understand the meaning. And it turns out when you're in your first year of Chinese medicine school, a lot of it is going to be just memorizing. And again, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. The other part of this question is, uh, do they find more enjoyable ways to teach the curriculum? Like, ideally, the answer would be yes. And um, so in, it's not like you just have to memorize. There should be some, some better ways to do it. Like, we just had a podcast with uh, Zach Louis, and he kind of said in the opening comments that he had Chinese teachers that would have him lay out in the sun to experience what it's like to have yang qi, or you'd have people... You'd have to stand in horse stance for three hours and press lung one and be like, what does this feel like? How is it affecting my meridians? Things like that. So ideally, we should have a better, uh, a fun way of teaching the curriculum. But in all honesty, at some point, you just have to memorize things. The other thing about this is, do they find more enjoyable ways to teach the curriculum? Kind of the honest answer is it depends on the teacher and just to kind of let you in on this this is probably maybe not a very nice thing to publicly disclose but um, when I first started teaching when I was put on as adjunct faculty I started at $25 an hour uh, for comparison this is in Southern California for comparison when I give an acupuncture treatment I was charging $80 an hour which was considered cheap for that time in that area so it's that's kind of how it was is sometimes I'd go teach a three-hour class and then I'd come home and treat one patient. I actually made more money treating the one patient than I did teaching for three hours. And it actually gets worse than that because when I say I made $25 an hour, really what it was is they took the number of class hours, multiplied it by 25, and gave it to me at, uh, as a salary. And so when I say I made $25 an hour, that was only for the time spent in class teaching. If I showed up before class and made copies, I didn't get paid for that. If I stayed after class and talked to students, I didn't get paid for that. If I was answering emails or writing tests or doing other things, I didn't get paid for that. It was also really kind of crappy because that also meant when it came to things like HIPAA training, FERPA training, and other required things, that was supposed to be included in the salary, and I didn't get paid for that. So kind of related to this is when we talk about do they find more enjoyable ways to teach the curriculum, you have to be really passionate about teaching in order to do that because if you're just making $25 an hour, it's hard to be really enthusiastic about finding exciting ways to motivate your t uh, students to learn the curriculum. And so this is just something I found there. Like, like at my school, we started at 25, and after years and years, you eventually worked your way up to like 45 or $50 an hour. 
And that was not just my school. I looked at other schools and the pay is comparable. And so you get people that they're either just not very enthusiastic about teaching their class. So this is just a side, a side gig that they do while, while they're building up their practice. Or you get teachers who have been there for decades and they've kind of just checked out. They're just kind of going on autopilot and, and that's what you get. So ideally you would have teachers who are very enthusiastic and find good ways to teach the material, but it turns out at $25 an hour, if you, so maybe put it this way, if, you're, if you have those teachers that they just stand in front of the room and they read from their slides and you're like, this is bullshit, probably the reason they do that is because they're getting paid like $25 an hour. If you have, if you ever like taken a test and you're like, this test is not at all what we learned in the classroom. Like what's going on? This test came out of nowhere. Probably what happened is your teacher did not write that test. Your teacher recycled that test from three teachers ago and they just passed down their materials because for $25 an hour, it's not worth it to rewrite your test or rewrite new lecture slides. They just recycle the old stuff and kind of make do with it. So that's the kind of thing that tends to happen. So if you get, if you get frustrated about why aren't they finding more creative ways or more enjoyable ways to teach the curriculum, it's because $25 an hour isn't quite a living wage in Southern California and that's what they're paying their teachers. So that's not a very nice thing to say, but that's kind of how it is. But then maybe we can ask what are some enjoyable ways to teach the, the curriculum. Some, some of the things I would like to do is um, any kind of hands-on stuff is good. So if you can uh, palpate the points, actually find the points, that's a little bit more enjoyable. Sometimes when you're learning the channels, I would get washable markers and have people draw on the channels. And that's how we learned the channels. That's how we did some soon measurements and things like that. So there are more enjoyable ways. With herbs, I really made it a point to cook herbal formulas or prepare herbs in different ways so that students could experience the herbs. And that kind of made it a little bit more real because herbs is especially difficult because at least with like acupuncture points, you can kind of point to them and locate them and press them and do things. When you're first learning single herbs, it's a lot of you're just memorizing herb functions and it can be really difficult to retain anything. So I would try to uh, cook herbal formulas in class if it was something related to what we were doing. Uh, either or make food samples, like I made those uh, black sesame balls, or I found a really good recipe for muffins that include all five flavors, um, things like that. So there are some things we can try to do to make them more enjoyable, but I guess the gist of this is, is it a lot of cramming and memorization? I'm going to say, at least initially, the answer is yes. Sorry, but that's the way it is. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And that's the way it is. So that is that. That's my answer to that, and that's my justification for that. Because I feel like a peop um, I said that on Facebook, and I think a, a few people disagreed with me. So this is just a, a live Q&A. So if you're in the chat and you want to ask questions, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat. And otherwise, I'm just going to sit here and bullshit to myself. So another exciting thing, announcements, another exciting thing that happened is uh, I made some t-shirts. When I say I made some t-shirts, what I really mean is I hired a graphic designer to make some designs and then I put them on t-shirts. So uh, if you want some acupuncture swag, there's a link in the description below. There's some t-shirts. We have uh, basically a bunch of unicorns. So yeah, acupuncture is magical on a t-shirt or there are a lot of other things. You could get it on a crop hoodie, which I might go ahead and get a crop hoodie of, acu of my acupuncture unicorn. Or you can get it on a tote bag. You can have, instead of just acupuncture is magical, you can get acupuncture is magical, but also kind of stabby, which I thought that was, was funny and a lot of people were offended by that. Acupuncture is magical. If you don't like black, you can get it on white or other colors. I uh, have a mug, a unicorn mug, so uh, it's kind of fun if you're in clinic and you want to have an acupuncture mug. Like I said before, I was going to make a free the stool mug, so tong bian means free the stool, so when we talk about our dra downward draining herbs, herbs like 
da huang, mang xiao, a lot of those herbs, they have an action of freeing the stool. And the Chinese is tong bian. So maybe you can uh, have your coffee cup. You can think about drinking your coffee and freeing the stool. It's also available on tote bags and other stuff. I got one of these pillows too. I think it'd be kind of cute to put a pillow in your clinic if you like have a couch in your waiting room. That might be kind of cute. So that's just a way that um, I thought those were kind of fun. I thought it was funny. If you want to support the, the channel, that's another thing you can do is get merch. I will say though that um, it actually can be an interesting marketing thing. I have had people that they were like, uh, they had just a tote bag that they got for free at some conference or symposium that said something about acupuncture and they were carrying their acupuncture tote bag around in Whole Foods and people actually stopped them and asked them like, oh, do you do acupuncture? And they, they, uh, you should always have your business cards with you. So they gave them a business card and they actually got patients that way by just walking around with in their everyday life with their acupuncture tote bag in the whole food so i think so if nothing else that might be an interesting um uh, marketing thing that if you go to your yoga class with your acupuncture t-shirt or if you shop in whole foods with your acupuncture tote bag it could be that you'd get people coming up to you and asking you about it i actually had the same thing and uh i i did one of those groupons to core power yoga and i had uh, gotten cupping I'd either gotten cupping or I'd done cupping on myself because a lot of times I try to cup myself. And when you have back hair, I don't recommend doing fire cupping on yourself. But um, I would go to yoga class and in the locker room, I'd had all these cupping marks on me. And so people would come up to me and like, oh, did you get cupping? Where did you do that? And it's actually a good, it's a good marketing technique is just, just walk around with cupping marks on you. And people will come up and, and ask you about that. So that's a... That's an interesting thing. So, th so those are available on the website was just the um, point of that. There's a link in the description below. Those are on uh, Teespring. Uh, I'll probably, I think uh, Lunar New Year is coming up, Chinese New Year, so maybe I'll put out a coupon code. But in the meantime, it turns out uh, Teespring, if you just Google Teespring promo code, there's a lot of 10% stuff that comes up. So if you put in special 10 or I, I use FOMO 10 and that worked recently, you might be able to get a 10% discount when you order that kind of stuff. So I think it's fun. If you want to try it, I ordered a bunch and they haven't arrived yet. So I can't show you the, the physical thing. I think they're arriving next week. So I just thought it was fun. So if you're into that kind of thing, I got, um, there's some stuff online that you can look for. So let's see what's going on in the comments. So Rui is asking, what do you think about online TCM consultations? Is it advisable? Um, I think it's kind of like it's gone in that direction just because we have to. Um, I think I think maybe nowadays it it's a lot of clinics are staying open, but I remember in the first days of COVID, we had a lot of people who um, only did online consultations. I think, yes, you can do it. I would like, ideally, you would want to see the person. You would want to be able to look at them, palpate the, palpate the points and everything like that, depending on your diagnostic style. But sometimes you don't have a choice that you have to do it online. And luckily now we can do things like over Zoom that you can actually look at the person's tongue and hear their voice and things like that. So I think you could do it and you could um, do some some basic recommendations about uh, herbal formulas. I think especially herbs. Herbs, it's a lot easier to do that way because herbs, you're a little bit more in your head. It's a little bit more analytical. You're listening to the, to the patient's symptoms, um, things like that. I think herbs, it's a little bit easier. Whereas acupuncture, you have to be more in your body. I like Zach used this uh, analogy of the back in the day, acupuncturists were like warriors going into the battle and it's your acupuncture needles were like your sword. And so I think with acupuncture, then you need to be more 
palpating the channels and things like that. You need to you need to be more hands on, so it's difficult to do online. But I think with herbs, it's a little bit easier to do stuff either over the phone. You can do stuff over the phone and have them send a picture of their tongue, um, things like that. You can still kind of get away with that and monitor them that way. But I have heard other people like. Um, on the podcast, Gary was talking about how he would do uh, at-home ear seed treatments where uh, they kind of do an intake, establish a diagnosis, and then uh, earseeds.com, you can go there and you can have the patient order their own ear seeds, and then he would go through and show them how to put them on and look at them and make sure that everything's correct. And so that was a way to do things at home when we were in lockdown. Um so you can do that way. So I think it's not ideal, but we've kind of gone in that direction. And it's kind of interesting. You also hear these stories about um, back in the day, back in China, you would have physicians uh, treating uh, women in court, especially I think it's like the emperor's concubines. And it was not, uh, basically you weren't, they weren't allowed to touch women uh, just because of social distinctions or, or what was going on that they were not allowed to actually maybe even see their patient or touch their patient, and so they just had to go off of it that way. They have stories about they would tie a thread around the wrist and observe the pulse that way. They couldn't actually touch the woman's wrist. They had to observe the pulse that way. And so that does exist in uh, traditional Chinese medicine. I think it's not ideal, but it's something that we do that sometimes it's necessary. So I think that's okay. Oh, replacement of herbs that you're not allowed. How do you describe ma huang tong without ma huang? Um, that's been kind of interesting because I'm I'm actually not sure if ma huang is still illegal in the U.S. And I think for a while you couldn't get it at all. Um, and then I've heard some people say that you can get the actual raw form and you may need to show your license or stuff like that. I haven't looked into that. Because honestly... Uh, at least in my practice, there's been very few times where I've actually wanted to prescribe Ma Huang. Um, but in terms of replacements, I'm not sure there are good, re like some of these herbs, we just don't have a good replacement. And so it's like for a while, it was very difficult to get U Jiao, donkey gelatin. Um, or some people just don't want to use it because they don't want to use animal parts. And they're like, what's a good replacement? It's like, I'm not sure there is a good replacement for U Jiao, um, or certain things like that. So I think Ma Huang is another. I'm not sure there's a good replacement. It turns out you can get ephedrine, at least in America, in, in some pharmacies, you can get ephedrine in pill form. It's just behind the counter. So you have to um, go in and show your ID, and they put me on a government list to make sure you're not uh, making meth. Um, but you can get like, you can look for like primatine or bronchate or certain asthma medications do have ephedrine in it. So I thought that would be kind of interesting is could you, if you had ma huang in the formula, could you cook the other herbs and then tell them to go and take some Sudafed on the side? I don't know if that would work or not. Um, so for that one, I don't know, but I'm going to be honest. There's been very few times when I've actually wanted to prescribe Ma Huang. Should you use local or distal points? I usually do some of each, uh, depending on what we're treating. So if we have like a, a problem, um, like especially if it's a musculoskeletal complaint, if a person comes in with knee pain, I'll do some points on the knee and then I'll do some distal points. Sometimes it depends on just your style that some people only like to do distal points. Um, and they'll claim that they can get good results never doing local points. Um, I'm just for me, that's never really worked out. I like to do a combination of both. Some, but I would say you should get good at using distal points because sometimes they'll just be in areas that you can't actually needle, that you might have, um, they might have a gaping open wound and you're like, oh, it's oozing and pussy. I don't want to stick needles in there because I might in cause a, cause an infection, cause a, um, um, auto, auto, what do they call it when you infect yourself? Cross-contamination versus the, 
uh, autogenous, autogenous infection. You might cause an autogenous infection. That was a question on one of my board exams. You might cause an autogenous or autogenous infection by, by needling into that. If, it, if there's already some oozing or pus there, they might have, uh, maybe they broke their ankle and now it's under a cast and you can't do local points. And so you have to think, you have to get creative about what am I going to do there? Am I going to needle the opposite side? Am I going to use a mirror image? If they have a problem in their ankle, I'm going to stick needles in their wrist on the opposite side. So um, ideally, I like to do both. I find that just doing local points usually doesn't work out that well. You need to do something to treat more uh, systemically. So if a person has knee pain, I don't just put points in the knee. I'll also do something systemic. Um, so I usually do a combination of both. How do you choose a school? Eh, I don't know. I just, I just, I found one that looked good. Halfway through, I started to not like it, but I just went and did it anyway. I'll be honest that when it comes to schools, I kind of have this attitude that basically, uh, maybe I'll put it this way. Um, I had a friend who teaches nursing, uh, and he would say he would always start out with an introduction on the first day. The first thing he would say is, if you're going to be a nurse, you need to understand that you are at the bottom of the totem pole. You are a slave to everyone. You're a slave to your patient. You're a slave to your charge nurse. You're a slave to the doctor. Uh, you are the bottom of the totem pole. And if you're not comfortable with that, you need to leave now. Just get out now because it's not going to change. It's not going to get better. That's what it means to be a nurse. The second thing he said was, when you're learning nursing, you need to understand from the beginning that the primary driver of your education is not the teacher. It is not the school. It is not the curriculum. The primary driver in your education is you. And that's something uh, I would recommend having that attitude that because I, I've seen a lot of students that they don't get what they want and they blame it on their teachers, they blame it on their schools, when I would say ultimately your education at the end of the day comes down to you. Uh, you'll get out of it what you put into it. And basically, I kind of got halfway through school and I didn't really like it. So I just figured it's up to me to learn what I wanted to learn. And so I started reading books. I started getting books like Applied Channel Theory in Chinese Medicine by Wang Juyi. And I started actually reading my textbooks and things like that and trying to get things out of it that weren't necessarily coming through in the classroom. And, and so I guess I, th I feel like a lot of schools, the schools exist to get you to pass your boards. The school exists so that you can be licensed. Uh, schools have to publicly disclose their pass rates on their licensing test. So they are mostly concerned with getting you to pass your boards. And not to be like real mean about the school on um, the schools, that seems kind of like not not very good for the schools, but on the other hand, it's like I've been on the other side of it talking to the students where like I try to explain something that I think is important, that I think is good for you to know clinically, that I think is going to make you a better healer. And then there are always students who are like, well, this isn't on boards. This isn't on the nationals test. Why do we have to learn this? Why do we have to waste our time memorizing this thing when it's not even on the boards? So I kind of get, I kind of understand why schools teach to the boards because we get those students of why am, I, why am I wasting my time and money on this when it's not even on the boards? So basically, I think of um, a lot of our modern schools, they're for-profit schools, and their goal is to get you to pass the boards, and then you try to take out of it what you can. If you find a good teacher, if you find a good instructor, try to uh, get from them what you can, and then other, but you're going to have to go outside of school. to. If you want to be really good, you're going to have to go outside of school and either read books, find mentors, get experience in clinics, things like that, and so... To me, I'm not sure there's a huge difference in the schools. I've had, I taught at a school and I had people transfer in from other schools and they said, oh, this is about the same. Uh, there are pros and cons to each one, but um, I'm not sure there's a huge difference between the schools just because the curriculums are so standardized. I would say make sure you look for an accredited school and it's possible that um, 
this is something we used to say 10 years ago. I'm not sure if it's still true, but we used to say, look for somebody um, who went to school in California just because the California licensing test is way more difficult than the national test. And so there's a much higher standard in the California schools than there is in some of the other schools where there's basically no regulation. Um, I'm not sure if that's still true, that if uh, I think nationals have gotten more difficult in recent years, so I'm not sure if that's true. But it's also like if you go in, if you go to a school in California, you must learn herbs. That's part of getting licensed is you have to learn acupuncture and learn herbs. Some people don't want to learn herbs, whereas if you I think if you uh, go to New York, you don't have to learn herbs. So that's another thing to think about. So schools, I don't know. I think they're all the same. I don't know, but I don't know a whole lot about different schools. So. Um, He's saying using Jingjie plus Fong Fong for Ma Huang. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I would say Jingjie, like, first of all, both of those are very neutral in temperature, where I think Ma Huang is a lot warmer in temperature, so you're going to have temperature issues. I think Jingjie is very good at promoting sweating, so that's, that's a possibility. If we're using it also for things like... Um, promoting urination to treat edema or things like that, maybe, maybe not. I think, I think that's going to depend on your application. So especially if you're trying to release things from the skin, if we're talking about like rashes and you want to release the skin, I think that would be good. Um, and, but in terms of like diffusing lung chi, um, a little, I think ma huang is just one of our best herbs for diffusing lung chi. So if we're talking about things like uh, Ma Xing Shi Gan Tang. I'm, I think I think you need Ma Huang. So so that's a possibility. I think it's going to depend on um, what you um, what you're treating. Oh, this is kind of good. my ex mom used to used to own an antelope horn that she would grind down with water and concoction that would bring down fever. Yeah, Ling uh, Ling Yang or uh, Ling Yang Jiao. Jiao means horn. So um, maybe we can look that up. Usually it's like a, it's a very good, I think it's good for calming wind especially, but yeah, I'm not, fever, I don't, I don't know, but if, but um, yeah, if we look up a uh, Ling Yang Jiao, drains liver heat, calms, extinguishes wind, so it's in this category of extinguish wind and stop, stop tremor is Ling Yang Jiao, and it's one of those that clears liver heat to brighten eyes, drains heat. Um, so yeah, it's very good for clearing heat and very good for bringing things down. Um, so that's interesting for a uh, fever. And yeah, usually the way you take it, because it's a horn, you usually don't boil it. You would usually like get it and grind it into shavings or like you uh, grind it up and take it with powder. So I'm saying, um... Is there is there a good replacement for that? Um, again, it's going to depend on what you're using it for. If you were, I mean, for calm for calming fever, uh, I would I would think more about releasing the exterior, or depending on what our fever is. Is our fever due to an external attack of wind heat, or is our fever due to heat toxicity? Um, think about that. But then I'd also just think about other things that are in that category. Um, for wind and tremors, if you're using it to uh, clear liver yang, anchor liver yang rising, extinguish wind, there are other things in that category. They tend to be heavy uh, medis uh, heavy um, minerals and things like that. So we do have other shells and things like that. And then maybe you just have to up the dosage. Like this is something we would talk about with rhinoceros horn, xi jiao. We would use rhinoceros horn to clear blood level heat. Well, you can't use a rhinoceros horn anymore, so a lot of people would use water buffalo horn as a replacement and it turns out it just doesn't work very well technically it can be used as a replacement but you might use shi jiao you might have used just a very small amount water buffalo horn you might use a very big amount just to get the same effect so um for that i would think about um other other things in that category are easier to get um you might even think about like um 
Longu Muli might have that same anchoring uh, ability, but then also things like hematite, magnetite, uh, other things in that category of uh, calming liver might be uh, good. And you might just have to use larger amounts. What do you think about Western replacements or Eastern plants? Um, that's interesting. Uh, I have a friend here who does that. She, uh, she does acupuncture and she specializes in mental health. And when I went to visit her, she was talking about how she makes her own teas and she kind of combines Western herbal teas with Eastern, with uh, uh, TCM herbs. And uh, she was getting good results with it. But like one of the main reasons she did it is nobody wants to drink Chinese herbs. That if you can make a, a Western, uh, use Western herbs and make a tea that actually tastes good and people will drink and people can make a ritual out of steeping the tea rather than boiling a decoction for 30 minutes. Uh, basically, um, the first step, if you want your herbs to work, the patient has to actually drink them. So um, that's something that she was developing a way to make sure the patients actually took the herbs. But she said she was getting good results. So um, I think that's that's an interesting idea. To me, it's difficult. Just what I know of Western herbology, just from a very superficial look at it, is we don't really look at Western herbs the same way we look at Chinese herbs in terms of taste, temperature, entering channel, how they affect um, the chi dynamic of the body. So uh, to me, that would make it very difficult. We would just have to go to things like valerian root is good for your, is good for sleep. Well, it's like, how does valerian treat insomnia? Does it nourish heart blood to treat insomnia? Does it nourish the liver to treat insomnia? Does it clear liver heat to treat insomnia? Um, is it good for kidney and heart not communicating, causing insomnia? I think it becomes very difficult and we might have to do some experimentation to see how that actually works because in China we had Shen Nong tasting the hundred herbs and he gave us all of that information. I'm not sure if anybody has done that work for our western plants as well so sometimes it's hard to um, get it out. Ricky is saying that's exactly right. It's all about the students motivation to get all they can get from their education. I'm in my second school, not because I didn't like the first one, because it decided to close. Yeah, I think a lot of schools are closing. Yeah, and that's kind of a difficult attitude for students, because I know that it's like a lot of students, I mean, I kind of had this attitude too. It was like, I'm paying all of this money, and I'm not getting what I want out of it. And so there are a lot of, at least in California, a lot of people were going $100,000 in debt. And it's really depressing to think that, I just spent $100,000 just to get a piece of paper, but the actual education, I did that work myself. And that's kind of, that's just kind of depressing, but that's also the reality of how it is. So, Michelle, I appreciate either your description of what it's like to teach. Believe it or not, even in the public school system, the more the more you work to make your lessons better, the less money you make per hour. Yeah, so it's basically like we're getting paid to be in the classroom. We're not getting paid to do work outside of the classroom. Um, and so, and you see that with a lot of, like the teacher burnout rate is uh, very high. So again, if you've been in school and you have this experience where you had a really good teacher and then you're like, all the good teachers leave after two years. Well, it's like, that's why. It's like, you can be really enthusiastic about it and really motivated for the first two years. After that, you're like, I'm making shit money. I'm putting in all this work and I'm dealing with all this bullshit from the students. This is not worth it. And so, like, don't be surprised when there's a high burnout rate. Thanks. What about using ginseng with chrysanthemum? That's a common cooling drink here. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, I think first of all, uh, when you when you're talking about using uh, for cooling, I would assume that one where like remember with ginseng renshen, we have a couple different varieties or a couple different preparations of renshen. You can use the basically the white or the red. You have bai renshen, the raw white ginseng, and then you have red hong renshen, hong shen, Korean red ginseng. 
and it's actually the same plant. It's just the, the way it turns red is they like steam it and cook it, and that causes it to turn red, and that's a little bit more warming, whereas the white ginseng is a little bit more cooling. If you really want to be cooling, uh, a lot of people go to American ginseng, and this is kind of funny. It turns out American ginseng is apparently very popular in China. So in America, we're all trying to get the Chinese ginseng the, or the Korean red ginseng, uh, and that's in high demand, but apparently it's the opposite in China that they want the American ginseng, the Xiangshen that's grown in Wisconsin because it's more cooling and it's more moistening. So it's a little bit better to take long term that if you take Korean red ginseng long term, you're eventually going to get some heat signs. I knew someone like this in school that they were really into Qigong and so they wanted to build up their chi. So they drank this Korean red ginseng every day. And it turned out they were just like always jumping around. They had bloodshot eyes. And then one day they came in and it's like, I have high blood pressure. Can you believe I'm such a healthy person? How do I have high blood pressure? And nobody was surprised because we're like, dude, you can't sit still. You've been drinking all this red ginseng. You gave yourself heat. Um, so this is really interesting because uh, when we look in the Materia Medica, when we talk about uh, chrysanthemum juhua, it's really for releasing the exterior, releasing heat, and it's good for brightening the eyes. Uh, but I think it was used more traditionally that um, it's it's actually is sweet in flavor and can be used as a tonic. So if you look in, in Bensky, in his commentary, he kind of talks about this, how the Taoists would actually use Juhua as a tonic, but you, you just take small amounts long term. And so that's, that's kind of interesting that when we use it in uh, our formulas, we think more about releasing heat in acute situations. But it turns out you can, uh, historically, it was used uh, more as a tonic to take something long term. So that's kind of, I think that's, that's kind of an interesting combination. Ginseng plus Renchen plus Juhua. Um, so that's really interesting. Another uh, common combination would be uh, Gochitsa, Goji berries plus Juhua. And so especially in the spring when you tend to, the, the spring winds come in and they're really dry and you tend to have eye problems, or you tend to have allergy problems or your eyes are really itchy. It's like you can use the Gochitsa to nourish liver and moisten and benefit the eyes that way. And then you can use a Juhua to, to cool things. So it's again like you're tonifying yin and clearing heat at the same time. Chamomile and chrysanthemum come from the same family. Can we swap, swap chamomile for chrysanthemum? And I'd be careful about that. Um, because I I mean I don't know. I would I would maybe say experiment with it and see if you get similar results. I mean those are both pretty mild. You're probably not going to kill yourself. Um, but just remember that sometimes with Chinese herbs, even if it's the same plant, it depends on where it grows that it could be different. Or sometimes just very slight variations in the plant can have different properties. So like we talked about Chuan Bei Mu versus Zhu Bei Mu. There's one form of uh, Bei Mu that's grown in Sichuan. There's another form that's grown in Zhejiang. And it turns out they have slightly different properties. Uh, Bei Shan, Bei Sha Sha, Bei Sha Shen and Nan Sha Shen. One is grown in the north, one is grown in the south. They have slightly different properties. Uh, Huai Niu Shi, Chuan Niu Shi have slightly different properties. And even when we talk about chrysanthemum, we have Ju Hua, regular chrysanthemum, and Ye Ju Hua, which is wild chrysanthemum. So one is chrysanthemum floss, the other is chrysanthemum indici floss. And so one is regular chrysanthemum, one is wild chrysanthemum. Turns out they have different properties. We even put them in different categories. That Ju Hua we put in cool, acrid, release the exterior. Ye Ju Hua we put in clear heat toxicity. And so we use them a little bit differently. So even if they're similar plants, if they have, uh, they come from the same family, I'd be a little bit, um, uh, I might be a little bit careful to assume that they have similar properties. I mean, same thing with mint. When we talk about bohu, a lot of people say bohu is mint. Well, it turns out when we say bohu is mint, we mean it's Chinese field mint. That is not the same as spearmint that I grow on my balcony. It turns out they're separate and they don't have similar properties. Earlier we were talking about ma huang. There's a Chinese form of ma huang, but we also have ma huang um, uh, ephedra that just grows wild in California. That's why they call it Mormon tea because in that area they would they would just 
take these plants and make it as a tea. And so the people would say, oh, can't we just use this ma huang that grows wild on, uh, on the side of the road in California? Turns out they're not the same thing, that the Chinese ma huang actually contains the active ingredient in ephedrine. Uh, the ma huang that grows in California or in America doesn't have that active ingredient ephedrine. The chemical uh, constituents are different. So if you go on Amazon and look for Mormon tea, it's not going to be the same thing as Chinese ma huang. So I'd be a little bit careful about that. Oh, uh, dental nurse is saying it's cold in Florida. I always thought it was always warm in Florida. So I'm cold might be a relative thing. Here it's like 12 degrees. Uh, I tend to go for hot chocolate. Where are you getting Chinese herbs? In the UK, it's not easy to get the Chinese herbs. Um, are you talking about as a practitioner or as just a normal person? Um, because usually in, in America, we have distributors that import things from China. And so we have a lot of companies like, uh, I usually use Mayway or New Herbs or Spring Wind. There's a bunch of other ones that are good for that. I don't, but I don't know about the UK. I would have to ask them. I know a few people who are in the UK. I would have to ask them about where they get them. Um <clears throat> Michelle, I love your Q&As. I feel like I'm just angry and I'm shouting. I'm not sure why anybody enjoys this. I think we need to have, like, we need to do this in the evening where we're drinking, kind of like the podcast. I think that would be better than doing it in the morning. Shalom says, I'm in Singapore and here we use American ginseng. Yeah, apparently it's... Um, it's in it's in high demand and and like I said I think it's it's a lot of people use it because it's better long term I think if I don't know maybe if it's um, there might be a lot of like dudes in America who are using it for erectile dysfunction or things like that and like oh we need that yang we need that heat I need the Korean red ginseng uh, I think really if you're trying to tonify your tea long term the American ginseng is going to be better for you long term. Do you know of a good tabletop herb grinder? I actually don't have one. Um, for certain herbs, I would we would just use a coffee grinder. Just go online, get a cheap um, $15 Mr. Coffee coffee grinder. So if you're grinding things like, um, there are some herbs we need to grind before we add them to the decoction. Certain like seeds that have a hard shell. So if you're grinding swan's ren, it is so much easier to just use a coffee grinder. Like a mortar and pestle, you'll be sitting there for 20 minutes. Just buzz it a few times on a coffee grinder. Huoma ren, uh, hemp seed, just use a coffee grinder. Um, I'd say even like jertza is pretty easy to crush. There are some things that are easy easier to just crush. But if you want like the, the industrial strength grinder... Um, Usually there are places that sell those. Some of those same herb distributors like Mayway or New Herbs or Lhasa would have those like more industrial strength herb grinders. And they usually have different sizes like little ones versus big ones. The kind where like the top actually screws on. Um, I feel like you can tell those are made in China because there are no safety features. Like you could have the top on and like the button will still turn on. It will be spinning and, and stuff like that. I've had people like grind up they take the lid off and then they actually hit the accidentally hit the button and they just like uh ching dye went everywhere like everything was purple their white lab coat was now dyed purple because they exploded ching dye in their face and the herb grinder um so for that one it kind of depends on what you want to do do you actually want to grind stuff into a fine enough powder that you can dissolve it in water then you need something industrial strength if you just want to like chop up your swan's out ren so it cooks better uh, you can just use a you just use a coffee grinder. Boop boop ba doo. Yeah, mung bean bean soup and Chinese pearl barley. Um, so that's something we talked about. Um, mung bean is lu do in the um, uh, Heat toxic in the clear heat. I was, was going to say drain fire. It's really in the heat toxicity category. Liu do is a uh, mung bean, and so that's very good for clearing heat. 
So if we look at Ludo, Ludo is mung bean. And it's good for summer heat and relieves thirst, clears heat and resolves toxins. So that's another thing. If you if it's like if it's hot during the summer, uh, you can eat watermelon. Watermelon is good for clearing summer heat and generating body fluids and alleviating thirst. Um, if you want something more cooked, you could use something like ludo because it resolves summer heat and relieves thirst. When you say Chinese pearl barley, we are talking about jobs, tears, e e ren. And this is another one that's very common to cook in a kanji. So e e ren, that's what we mean by um, per, uh, Chinese pearl barley. So this is not the same if you just, like in America, if you just went to the grocery store and you bought barley to make barley soup, this is not the same. e e ren is actually a different species. And um, we tend to use that a lot uh, in kanjis to strengthen the spleen and um, get rid of dampness, but it also is cool in temperature, so it's good for clearing heat and clearing damp heat. Um, so we look at it, it is slightly cold or cool in temperature. So that's another thing you can eat to clear heat. That's good. And it makes a good kanji. So both of these cook down really well. Um, if you just get the regular uh, ee ren, like you have to cook it for a long time. It's like, it's not like, oh, you just boil it for 10 minutes and it's good. You have to cook it for a long time. Um, so that's another one. Boop, 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 boop. He says, I got mine from the Chinatown in London where I lived in Brighton. So I'm assuming that's, that's where I'm, either the herbs, yeah, you can get in Chinatown, or, or if you're looking for an herb grinder, it can get, you can probably get that as well. I'm a student at Pecom New York and recently been thinking about community acupuncture. Because, yeah, it's acupuncture is viewed as a luxury instead of a necessity. I mean, sometimes it's really annoying because I feel like a lot of people view acupuncture as like a spa treatment. Like, I'm going to get my massage, I'm getting my facial, I'm getting my acupuncture, and they just view it as um, massage, like a special version of massage that is like a, a spa treatment, not as actual medicine. So that's kind of annoying. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of, um, community acupuncture, uh, we did have a, a podcast, um, with a student who was doing community acupuncture. So if you go to the podcast here, um, let's go to episodes, look at all those episodes. This was a uh, Zach, Zachary Ray. Uh, is community acupuncture real acupuncture with Zachary, uh, Zach Ray, and he's, he goes to Polka Tech. And so it turns out Polka Tech is, that's a school that, uh, teaches exclusively community acupuncture. So they're, they're a school that they, oh, that basically the, I think it's the, the mission of that school is to build up community acupuncture, to get more community acupuncturists and try to really build up. And so this is kind of an interesting podcast where um, Zach kind of talks about the same thing, where it's his goal is to make acupuncture accessible to everybody and, it, and community acupuncture might be the best way to do that. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting thing. I don't do a whole lot with I haven't ever done a whole lot with community acupuncture, but I know people who do. So um, it's kind of an interesting paradigm. And, and um, it was kind of interesting talking to him, talking about the different way, the treatment things that they they do, the some of the things that they learn, because usually community acupuncture, you're like sitting in a chair, which I don't know why. I feel like you could still do community acupuncture. You, instead of like filling the room with chairs, you could still use massage tables. I don't know why you have to use chairs. Um, when I first was introduced to acupuncture, I was in India. They had a clinic, and basically it was like a long shed, and they had just rows of um, 
they weren't like fancy massage tables. They were just like wooden tables that they put a blanket on. But it was still it was still kind of community style where it's like you would go in, you would see the main doctor, he would take your pulse, do the intake, and he would write down the prescription, the point prescription that he wanted to do on a piece of paper. And sometimes he would hand that to someone else and someone else would actually insert the needles and do the thing. But it was kind of like, it was still kind of community style where it's like you were sitting, you were lying on a table right next to somebody else. So I feel like that's a possibility. But it's possible that if you're doing the community style in America where you sit in those gravity chairs, you might be limited on what kind of points you can d get to. You might not be able to do back shoe points. You might not be able to do points on the Ren channel. So you might have to get a little bit, little bit more creative of how do you use your five shoe points? How do you use your antique points and things like that? So that's kind of... Um, Interesting. I know in PCOM San Diego, they usually had one shift that was a community shift. It could be that with lockdown and the virus happening, they probably got rid of that because there's a lot of disinfecting that has to be done. So it could be that they don't do that anymore. But there were things that did specifically community acupuncture. All right, with some points such as stomach 40 and kidney 26, they transform phlegm. What do they mean by that? I thought phlegm was a bad thing. Yes, uh, phlegm is a bad thing. Transforming it just means we're getting rid of it. So we kind of see the same thing with herbs. Um, that's just the term we use for getting rid of phlegm, of transforming phlegm. Now, some people will ask, what does it transform into? I would kind of, I don't, I don't really know. I think it just transforms into nothing. Um, so a lot of times we're talking about the, the spleen has a function of transformation and transportation. On the one hand, it transforms, uh, it rots and ripens the food and sends it out to the various organs. With that transformation and transportation, we can also say it transforms dampness and, and things like that. What does it transform into? I don't know. I'm not sure it transforms it into anything. So some people try to say that when we transform dampness, we're taking bad fluids and turning it into good fluids. I think that uh, Wang Juyi specifically says no. Once something is evil or pathogenic, we can't transform it into something good. Other people will uh, debate that. I've heard people say, oh, we can take pathogenic heat and turn it into good heat. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But I think transforming phlegm, we're really just talking about getting rid of the phlegm. Kind of like with herbs, we say aromatically transform dampness. What are we doing to the, like, what does it transform into? I don't know. It's just the body's way of getting rid of dampness. Um, so it's kind of like with dampness, we can drain the dampness through the urine. We can dry out the dampness using bitter things, or we can aromatically transform the dampness. And usually I think of that when we say aromatically transform dampness, it's like we're using the aroma to waken up to uh, wake up the spleen so that it can perform its action of transforming dampness. Transforming phlegm, I kind of think of the same way. We're not, ne we're just getting rid of the phlegm. We're not necessarily coughing it out. We're not necessarily purging it out through the large intestine. It's just, you have this like icky evil phlegm there and we're transforming it and it poof goes away. So that's what I would, I would think of. Uh, yeah, use a pressure cooker for the, yeah. Yeah, that, I think that's a good investment, get a pressure cooker. Some, like I know some people would cook herbs in a, in a pressure cooker as well, but definitely if you're like doing something like E.E. E. Ren, if you're trying to, or if you're trying to make um, kanji, it's like if you want, if you want to make kanji, like you would have to boil the rice for like eight hours in order to make it into a kanji. If I wanted to make a kanji, I would just use a pressure cooker or use one of those uh, instant pot. I think an instant pot is kind of like a pressure cooker, so... Boop, boop, ba -doo. I don't think there's anything else. Oh, we've been going for an hour. Maybe we should wrap it up. Because I got things to do today. When I say things to do, I that's really just, I have to pet the cat. And, Go shopping, do some laundry. I really don't have real things to do. I don't have a real life. Anything else fun in here?
Boop, boop, ba -doo. I think we already got to that. We already got to that. If you have any more questions, go ahead and leave them in the chat. Otherwise, I might just call it a day, go and get on with my life, drink some tea, edit some videos. Uh, there were some live streams we did this week that we need to go edit. And then um, it turns out I'm, uh, I'll be out of town for the next couple weeks. I'm going to go see my dad for a couple days and then drive down to Kentucky and clean up some tornado debris um, and do that for a week in Kentucky. And then uh, I might go see, uh, there'll be like Chinese New Year around then, so I might go see uh, Patrick in Louisville, Kentucky, and maybe we will... Uh, I think he's been drinking scotch lately. He used to be such bourbon snobs. I think he's now he's gotten into scotch, so maybe we'll drink some scotch and do a podcast. Or two. Eat some dumplings. So uh, there might not be a, a whole lot going on on the channel for the next two weeks just because I'm going to be out of town, so we probably won't be doing any, uh, any of these live Q&As or um, any of the online classes for the next couple weeks, so sorry about that. We'll be out for a couple weeks. Other than that, thanks for being here. Again, we got lots of lots of fun merch on the on the website. If you want some uh, some unicorn acupuncture merchandise, that's on the website. There's a link to that in the description below. If you want to know when things happen coming up, there is a, a link to the email list uh, there below as well. So look look down there. There's a link to you can sign up for the email list, and that's how I usually send out all the announcements about uh, when new stuff is coming out and when the live streams are. Or uh, follow me on Instagram. I usually put it in the Instagram stories. So TCM Study on Instagram. As always, thank you to everyone who supports the uh, this channel. These videos are brought to you by viewers like you. So to everyone who joins the Patreon, donates on Buy Me a Coffee, all that stuff, thank you for doing that. We really appreciate that. Um, because you do that, I'm able to not have a real job, and I'm able to do things like go to Kentucky and help, uh, help people with tornadoes. Um, mm, 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 mm. So thank you for that. Uh, if you like the videos, uh, I know that not everybody can donate financially, but if you like the videos, feel free to share them with your friends, share them with your study group. And there are also paid, there are also courses that also helps us out too. Uh, the stuff on courses. Can you do a video on menopause? That would be interesting. Um, Cause I'm trying to think if, if that's like a, a traditional if that has like a disease name in Chinese, I'm not sure if, if menopause has a has a disease name in Chinese. Um, so we'd probably want to look at uh, Machiocha has a uh, has an OBGY women's health book. Um, um, boop, 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 boop. Uh, so yeah, but it's something we do see a lot in the modern clinic that a lot of people will come in for. Usually, um, usually we're we're just, dealing with some yin deficiency. So if we go look at over some of the things that treat yin deficiency, that's that's kind of where we would start as we see a lot of um, like hot flashes. And we, sometimes we say tidal heat effusion, that's like hot flashes, five center heat, night sweats is a really big thing. Um, and so I would start to look at clearing deficiency heat. Sometimes we have a combination of both yin and yang deficiency. So a dual vacuity of yin and yang. Um, sometimes we get a lot of um, kidney and heart not communicating. So uh, there's that video. Boop, boop, ba -doop, boop, boop. If you go on the YouTube channel, Tianwang Bushindan. So if you go on, um, if you go on YouTube and look up Tianwang Bushindan. Uh, the first one that comes up is a video I did about this formula where we talk about kidney and heart not communicating and there there's actually an example of treating a woman with menopause but here it's she not only had like the hot flashes and night sweats she was also experiencing some anxiety and so that's why we went with um, kidney that 
uh, yin deficiency heat was going up into the heart, causing some heart deficiency as well. So that was an example of somebody who had menopause, but it was specifically they were experiencing symptoms of anxiety. Because first she came in and she was just like, oh yeah, I'm going through menopause. I got the hot flashes. I got the night sweats. And I'm like, okay, well, that scene sounds pretty forward. Let's just clear some deficiency heat, give you some Durbai Di Huang Wan. And she came back and was like, yeah, not a whole lot's changed. And so I kind of went back and asked her a few more questions. And she was saying, like, yeah, when I get these hot flashes, I also like get these little like panic attacks, like mini anxiety. I feel my heart pounding and I get real anxious. And that's something that happens along with these hot flashes. And I said, oh, that's a sign that that heat is going into the heart. Let's use Tian Wang Bu Don, that it will tonify kidney yin clear the deficiency heat, but also tonify the heart and clear things out of the heart. So that's why we went with that formula. Um, but yeah, maybe we can, that would be interesting to do something where we kind of go through all the patterns of menopause. We'd have to think about something to do for that. So I think that's really it. That's really it for this time. I'm going to uh, go get on with my life. Oh, he says I have I have early menopause. Um, yeah, that's that's usually where we're thinking about some sort of deficiency heat, but there are other possible complicating factors that we might need to worry about. Is it yin? Is it just yin deficiency with heat? Is it yin and yang deficiency? Is that heat going up into the heart? Things like that. So that might be an interesting thing to look at. But that's all for today. I'm going to go buy some new chainsaw chaps because apparently chainsaw chaps must be orange in order to count. If you have gray chainsaw chaps, nobody will see you and you're a hazard. So I have to go buy some orange chainsaw chaps, maybe a raincoat. I might shave my beard because N95 masks work better when you don't have a beard, so I may shave my beard. And that's what I'm doing with my day. That's how I'm spending my weekend. That's it for today. If you have more questions, leave them in the comments below, and we'll, we'll get to them next time. Or just send me an email, and we'll do that next time we're here. Thanks for being here. Have a good weekend. Ooh.